Hi, Academy team, and welcome to the Academy Forum one more time. Uh, you have done a great work in responding to the, uh, the grand round post that we put on the portal for you on Monday. The topic was, can you have a look in my mouth, mouth doc? Um, oral medicine and mouth lesions are a topic that not many of us are confident with. Not many of us have been, you know, received enough training in our medical schools, unfortunately. But as GPs, we see a lot of patients coming to us with symptoms related to the mouth. Uh, sometimes when it's a lesion, it makes us even more uncomfortable because we, we know that one differential diagnosis at least would be an SCC, for example, which it can, can cost the patient's life and we scratch our head. We don't know how urgent it is. We don't know if it's just a simple mouth aftus or is it is it an STC I'm going to miss and cause trouble. And referring a patient to a specialist is not going to happen straight away. So you know that in particularly in the public system, you have months and months of waiting. So it's to us as GPs to decide if this patient needs to be referred urgently. Do I send this to pa patient to emergency so they can get on the list of the outpatient clinic in the oral physicians? Or can I just afford to wait for a couple of weeks? Is there anything I can try? Can I just reassure the patient just saying, don't worry, this is just a simple mouth aftus or something that you don't need to worry about, or it's just like a trauma. Which way do I go? Is a big thing that many of us as GPs with poor access to public health system and obviously the financial pressure from patients who can't afford to go to the private system becomes a burden. And uh, for us, luckily, we have access to specialists uh, around us, some enthusiastic specialists doc like Dr. Lali Matiwari, who has given us her precious time and we have put three cases out, the things that as GPs we face and we don't know what to do as a quiz. We had good response from you and now Lalima and myself are going through, through the, the three cases in your quiz and if we get a chance at the end, I would ask Lalima to please present a bit on a burning mouth or burning tongue syndrome, which is something that again, in general practice, we see a lot and we don't know what to do with. So I leave you to in hands of uh, Lalima. Lalima, to you. Thank you, Sol. And hello, GP Academy. It's really good to be here and be sharing um, something that I'm really excited and passionate about and love to see and treat. And I'm really glad to be sharing some cases with you and just definitely some clinical tips and skills to be used when a patient presents to you with some of these questions and concerns that they have. Um, definitely in some part of your GP career, you will experience um, a scenario where a patient is concerned about an oral lesion. And so hopefully we'll, um, you know, I'm able to impart some of the knowledge to you guys today. So thanks again, Sol, for having me on. Um, I'm quite excited about this. So our first case that uh, we saw was a 67-year-old female um, who presented with a um, asymptomatic white plaque on the left lateral tongue and she reported a history of it being there for about six months. Um, so that is that in itself is quite a significant um, thing to be remembering when you are sort of a assessing the patient is the duration of a lesion. Um, anything persistent is something to uh, almost like a red flag going um, should be going up. Um, medically fit and healthy and then she's got a history of smoking as well so that's again a red flag. So a white plaque which is persistent in a history of smoking um, you should be sort of already suspicious of the nature of this condition. Um, in examination, you know, what we can see here is a white plaque um, and then you want to have a look at the characteristics of the plaque in itself. So what the borders are appearing like, are they well defined or uh, diffuse? 
Um, is the color consistent throughout? Is it the same sort of white appearance across the whole board or would you be able to see any sort of mixed red or white patches occurring? So in this particular example here, it is purely just a white plaque that we can see. The term non-homogenous, which we'll talk about a little bit more in detail, essentially refers to the texture consistency of the entire lesion. And um, again, it's an important characteristic characteristic to consider when assessing patients with um, white plaques. So the first question for this case was list some differential diagnoses and that basically is making you think about your diagnostic sieve. Um, when it comes to white plaques in the mouth there are multiple different presentations and um, they come from varying etiologies as well. So the first thing that one can consider, and this is sort of a flow chart of one type of a thought process um, that I'll sort of walk you through. Um, so you, you see white lesion in the mouth and you can sort of firstly decide whether this is something that the patient may have had since childhood, for example, and that's where that history sort of comes in. Or is it acquired? So in our particular case, the um, lesion has only really been recent in the past six months, so we're looking in the acquired section. The next, the next thing that you can consider, and it's a very simple trick um, that you can use chair side, is you get a piece of gauze and you try and wipe the lesion. So trying to scrape it off and wipe it off to see if the lesion actually completely wipes away. If it can't be, if it can be scraped off, um, you are considering it to either be a reactive, so a reactive lesion, which could be from a simple chemical burn, thermal burn, or even um, trauma, like mechanical trauma. Um, although pseudomembranous candidosis also wipes off, the differentiation being that there would be an underlying sort of red erythematous um, background once the white uh, lesion is in fact wiped off. So that's a really um, quick and simple way of seeing if something is possibly reactive or potentially infectious to a different type of entity altogether, which can um, fall into this next category of the flow chart here. So when we go into lesions that cannot be wiped off, um, again, you can further differentiate the possibilities of um, what could be happening depending on um, looking at the lesion a little bit closely. Um, so most typically, we can differentiate it further into whether there are any striations present. So striations are almost like a lace-like pattern. So is it just a complete plaque across or can you see any sort of lace-like or interwebbing occurring throughout the lesion or is it without striations? The reason why I've differentiated it in this, these two scenarios is there are certain lichenoid um, presentations such as oral lichen planus, lichenoid mucositis and even lupus erythematosus that can present with that typical reticular striated pattern um, and that can then further help you sort of go down that direction in terms of your um, provisional diagnoses. Whereas without stri, you're then again further directed into a different entity altogether. Um, and these include sort of certain site-specific features. So if, for example, you're looking at a white plaque on the hard palate in a smoker, you may be considering a diagnosis of nicotinic stomatitis. Um, or for example, if it was a white plaque on the lip, um, you may be considering a differential diagnosis of actinic colitis. In this case, again, um, non um, Non-site specific uh, white plaques that do not wipe off can include frictional keratosis, certain HPV related lesions such as uh, Veruca vulgaris which although not typically are completely plaque like but they can appear white, chronic hyperplastic candidosis um, and leukoplakias. Now this is sort of one thought pattern that you can consider adopting when you're assessing white lesions. The other one can be uh, based on sort of the underlying etiology. So you can sort of classify these lesions further in terms of congenital, reactive, infectious, immune mediated, metabolic, you know, premalignant, neoplastic or idiopathic. So specifically for our case, um, you know, pseudomembranous candidosis, 
a little bit less extent, but the lichenoid um, features, because some oral lichen planus lesions can appear plaque type. Um, the thing to consider though is these conditions generally would have more widespread generalized lesions rather than the one isolated lesion. Frictional keratosis, so you would want to probe the patient further about a history of trauma to the area. Chronic hyperplastic candidosis and a leukoplakia could be your differentials that you'd like to consider for this patient. Now the most likely diagnosis, however, for this patient is in fact an oral leukoplakia. Um, so this is actually a keratotic lesion which is classified as an oral potentially malignant disorder. And one of the key characteristics of this is that it definitely cannot be wiped off. So if you're able to wipe a lot of it, you're not dealing with a true leukoplakia. Um, and the most important feature of this lesion is that it does harbor a risk of developing oral cancer, which is why the um, definition of a leukoplakia by World Health Organization is a white plaque of questionable risk, having excluded other known diseases or disorders that carry no increased risk for oral cancer. So it's essentially a diagnosis that you make after excluding every other possibility. So if you cannot identify a traumatic component um, in the patient's history. You cannot identify possible immune mediated factors um, in the patient history and you've sort of excluded all other possibilities. You may be looking at a true leukoplakia um, which then needs definitely further um, investigations. Now leukoplakias can present um, in varying uh, presentations as well. So, and this is what I was talking about, the homogenous and non-homogenous appearance. Um, so when clinically assessing a leukoplakia, it is important to make the distinction between homogenous and non-homogenous. And so what you want to be focusing on is the color, the consistency, the texture, and the borders. So if all of those features are consistent throughout the lesion, so for example, in this particular patient, you've got the same sort of homogeneity of the color across the lesion, the texture is the same and the consistency is the same. It's not thicker in one part and thinner, thinner in another part and you can follow the borders um, of the lesion fairly distinctly. You would classify this as a homogeneous leukoplakia. If the features are not consistent throughout the entire extent of the lesion, even in one of the categories, so for example, in our case, you've got an area, um, the texture is definitely different throughout the entire lesion, even though the color is white across. You've got in the anterior aspect of this lesion is definitely appearing more thicker in texture um, compared to the posterior aspect of it. And even the border itself, while it's somewhat well-defined, it's not as regular as in the homogeneous case. Um, so why do we actually differentiate between the two though is because non-homogeneous leukoplakias actually carry a lot higher risk of malignant transformation. So again, when you are assessing a patient with a white plaque that is, you may be thinking is a leukoplakia, the next step that you'd want to consider is, okay, what is the potential risk of this harboring dysplastic changes or harboring, you know, potential malignancy within the lesion itself? Um, there is also a rare type of uh, non-homogeneous leukoplakia that can present with um, multiple or multifocal lesions as we call it. Um, and this particular type of leukoplakia is a proliferative verrucous leukoplakia. And should you ever come across this in your um, you know, in your clinics, it is a definitely an urgent referral because the risk of this particular condition becoming into a malignancy is almost 60%. Um, so these patients, unfortunately, are very difficult to manage because their leukoplakias, even if you try to treat them, they keep recurring, they're persistent, and they're very hard to clinically manage. So um, if you ever come across the w multiple white plaques in a patient's mouth, especially if there is that underlying history of um, typical risk factors for oral cancer, which are obviously smoking and excessive alcohol intake, um, red flags should definitely be um, coming up here and considering an urgent referral. 
So investigations um, that would assist us in our diagnosis is obviously an incisional biopsy. Now, generally, we I would suggest referral to either a maxillofacial surgeon for the biopsy, your oral medicine specialist or ENT, depending on who is available to you, um, for the patient to undergo an incisional biopsy and have a histopathological assessment of the leukoplakia. Um, what we're essentially looking for in histopathology is the presence or absence of dysplasia or malignancy. So leukoplakia in itself is just a clinical term. You're never going to get a diagnosis of a leukoplakia on a biopsy. Um, what essentially you're looking for is are there any abnormal cell changes that represent either dysplastic changes or malignancy. Um, the, and the reason behind that is again, you're further understanding the risk of the lesion in general. So for this particular case, the final diagnosis was in fact a non-homogeneous leukoplakia with moderate epithelial dysplasia. So what is the appropriate management for this patient based on um, our most likely diagnosis, which was a non-homogeneous leukoplakia? So the fundamental goal of these leukoplakias is to prevent the development of oral squamous cell carcinoma. And this basically starts with your accurate and definitive diagnosis. Um, we want to ensure prevention of malignant transformation, so uh, reinforcing the importance of tobacco cessation. If the patient is consuming excessive alcohol, you want to help them reduce alcohol. Um, you know, you can even educate them on the fact that both alcohol and smoking together actually significantly multiplies the risk of them to develop oral cancer. It's almost about 17 times. And so that is, and basically it's because they both work synergistically together to further um, progress the rate of malignant transformation. So definitely in your patient with suspected leukoplakia, tobacco cessation, reduction alcohol intake, improving diet and nutrition is key. Then obviously the secondary prevention. So if you are suspecting um, the recognition of early malignancy or even a leukoplakia which has the possibility of dysplastic changes, you want to consider a referral to have that leukoplakia either removed as best as possible or they're placed on close observation with the um, oral medicine specialist or maxillofacial surgeon. And generally speaking, the decision to either treat the leukoplakia with surgery or to um, observe them clinically is more so decided about the risk of malignant transformation um, personally for that patient. So essentially what we're trying to do is to overall reduce the morbidity of the patient, so preventing them from developing a um, oral cancer. And then once the leukoplakia is in fact treated or surgically removed, they're placed on close observation to ensure that the leukoplakia is not recurring or the, that the lesion is not progressing. Um, just quickly, in terms of the risk of malignant transformation, so for a leukoplakia, it's about 8.6%. Um, I know that knowing that detail doesn't actually do much clinically. So what would be actually more recommended um, is to consider these sort of factors when you are considering the risk factor for this particular patient. So this again goes back to your classic scenario of um, let's say the non-homogeneous leukoplakia patient in your clinic um, and you have, you know, let's say you have taken the, the biopsy and the moderate dysplasia has been um, confirmed. If the patient is of advanced age, female gender, they've had their leukoplakia for quite a long time, um, if they are in fact non-smokers and non-drinkers and the leukoplakia is on their tongue or floor of mouth and is greater than two centimeters, um, is non-homogeneous in appearance, or they have a previous history of oral carcinoma, the likelihood of them developing um, malignant transformation of that leukoplakia is very high. And so that is again um, a sort of red flag situation. And if you were to ever consider the possibility of is this something I sit on and watch a little bit longer or is this a patient that does need urgent attention, these are the key features that you can definitely use to make that decision make that decision um, and if they do have this then obviously it is that urgent referral that you're looking at.
Um, just a little bit about what dysplasia and the reasons why we actually care for the presence of dysplasia is that actually a patient who has um, a histopathological diagnosis of moderate dysplasia carries about an 18% um, chance of malignant transformation on their own. Add that to the other clinical factors, that sort of progresses even further. So that's why we sort of um, evaluate the lesion from the clinical perspective and the patient perspective, and then at the cellular perspective, so with histopathological findings, to overall determine the risk for that patient and decide if this is something that needs treatment in terms of surgery or if the patient can be placed on close clinical observation. Um, so for this, uh, for our case, um, the most appropriate management is, in fact, an urgent referral to your, um, you know, oral, med, um, oral maxillofacial surgeon or ENT or head and neck surgeon that you would work with for local excision of the leukoplakia. Um, obviously, reinforce the smoking cessation, and it is important that the patient is kept on close clinical observation to ensure recurrences does not occur. Usually, the specialist who did the excision would be monitoring the patient. Um, however, after a certain period of time, they may actually refer back to their general GP to ensure that there's no uh, recurrence occurring. Um, if you're not comfortable with such a thing, you can consider a referral to their general dentist as well, who can ensure that there is no recurrence occurring there also. So that's with case one. Um, Sol, did you want to have any other questions with anything that may have come up in, in what I was saying, or that's all okay for this case? Yeah. No, look, uh, I, I really learned uh, quite a few good things, but I, I also learned that I try to wipe off the look of the the, the, the yes. white uh, lesion, and if it goes away, at least I know it's not something exactly. nasty. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I wanted to to ask: How important is pain and tenderness of the lesion? Does it guide us in any specific direction, or doesn't? Um, that's a very good question. So. In the context of a leukoplakia, if we're talking about it, majority of the times they are not um, symptomatic. And that actually does not correlate to the possibility of an early malignancy being there. So you can't really decide if a patient has a white plaque, but they're not having any problems with it, that it may not in fact carry dis you know, dysplastic changes or even early malignancies, which is why it's not part of um, those clinical risk factors that we spoke about. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not really a guiding factor in this sense. Having said that, um, well, unfortunately, when pain does occur with these lesions, it is in fact because it's quite advanced by then anyway. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to really um, prevent is that outcome um, and ensure that we're, if there is any early malignancy, we're on top of it early and they generally are always asymptomatic. Got it. The other question, uh, probably it's very early days, but yeah. have, is there any information out about the relation between e-cigarettes and vaping and oral uh, malignancy or oral disease? Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, very good question. So yes, there is actually um, definitely preliminary studies that are suggesting that um, e-cigarettes or vaping are um, enough to cause cellular changes in the mouth and have been linked at least in the, like laboratory studies showing that um, they're causing dysplastic changes and showing that sort of malignant change across the board. Um, so it is obviously in the sense of trying to get a smoker to quit their tobacco, et cetera, and you know, use vaping instead as a smoking cessation device. It's almost like, you know, which which is a bad one that you want to get rid of, and that's definitely the cigarette smoking. Um, but it is just something to consider because now it, vaping is becoming more of a social thing as well, even in patients who are not who weren't originally um, advised it for smoking cessation purposes. And so they are the um, type of patients that sort of are increasing their risk of these cell changes occurring um, without really realizing it. So yeah, we're definitely seeing a bit of a trend of that. Got you. And just to clarify, what I learned was that smoking and drinking alcohol increases your risk of oral cancer in the form of leukoplakia and then eventually SCC. Yeah. However, if someone has leukoplakia, yeah. the 
a non-smoker with leukoplakia is at higher risk of transitioning to cancer as opposed to a smoker with yes. leukoplakia. Yeah. Yeah, and that's it. And the reason for that is, so your most um, common presentation of a leukoplakia will be in a smoker. And uh, that's generally where these lesions um, are associated with. However, when you are seeing a leukoplakia in a patient who doesn't actually have those risk factors, it's actually indicating more of a genetic molecular abnormality that's driving the leukoplakia. So those molecular alterations are actually a lot more vigorous in this patient with who's, who doesn't have those traditional risk factors for malignancy compared to a leukoplakia with the risk factors. And so um, that's where that difference is. Yeah, so it's less environmental and more genetic. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Lalima. I think we can move on to the second one if you're ready. Awesome. Yep. So <clears throat> case number two was a 85-year-old female um, presenting with oral burning uh, for the past three weeks. And her medical history, she had a bit of complex medical history and she was you know, on some medications for hypothyroidism, gourds, um, hypercholesterolemia and hypertension. And intraorally, you notice that there are some creamy adherent white plaques, you know, widespread across the oral cavity. She also has some signs of quite a dry mouth and then she also reports that she's recently completed a course for a um, course of antibiotic therapy. So in this scenario here or in, this, um, in these clinical pictures you do see that classic presentation of creamy white plaques across the entire, generalized across the entire oral cavity and you can also see how dry the oral mucosa is. So when, you know, you, especially the tongue, you can see the fissuring and the grooves across the tongue. Another way of, um, I guess, also evaluating oral dryness um, is, I guess, actually, the other question I have. So in your GP, um, in the actual clinical setting, do you have access to sort of these intraoral mirrors or is it mainly like the um, tongue depressors and things like that that you would use to assess um, the oral, yeah. oral cavity? No, normally, we don't have the mirrors. We just have the tongue depressor. Yeah. You look, even with the tongue depressor, what you could do is um, you're assessing the stickiness of the tongue depressor on the mucosa. So usually um, in the dry mouth you will find that it does stick quite easily to the oral mucosa. Um, it's definitely more apparent with mirrors and things like that but um, if you've got a nice healthy flow of saliva it should sort of be sliding around fairly nicely inside the mouth. Um, so that is another sort of way to check for oral dryness without um, you know, needing to do anything, any special investigations or anything like that. So just seeing if your tongue depressor in fact sticks to inside the cheek um, is an indication of oral dryness as well. Now, in terms of the first question for this case, what is the most likely diagnosis? So that's um, pseudomembranous candido candidosis, um, which is also commonly known as thrush. And we know that candida albicans is one of the more common um, pathogenic uh, contributors towards this infection. And the reason behind the fungal infection itself is we've got that sort of imbalance between the virulence factors and the patient's host defense, which is compromised. Having said that, oral candidosis can present differently in the mouth as well. And I did want to quickly go through that um, because the most common presentation is obviously your creamy white plaques. Um, and I think a lot of GPs are fairly confident in managing such a condition. But there are some other um, other presentations. So patients can also have what we call erythematous candidosis, where you've got almost that smoothing of the tongue and it's looking red and raw. They'll often also present, if you have a look on the roof of the mouth and the hard palate, what's called a kissing lesion, where the fungal infection has transferred onto the hard palate. And this sort of presentation can often be seen in patients who have topical or long-term systemic corticosteroid use, antibiotic therapy as well. 
Um, I did briefly mention chronic hyperplastic candidosis as a differential diagnosis in the previous um, case. And this is a, another form of um, candidal infection, which obviously is chronic and classically presents on bilateral buccal mucosa, but it can occur in other parts of the mouth as well. Previously, it was thought to be called candidal leukoplakia, and there is still a controversy whether this also can carry the risk of malignant transformation. But in all of these scenarios here, obviously antifungal therapy is key for management, um, but also understanding what the predisposing factors are in terms of um, looking after your patient as well. Other forms that may also, other presentations of candidosis that may come through to your clinic also are angular colitis. So patients will often complain of um, redness and tenderness along the corners of their lips. Um, and generally, if these patients have um, sort of recurrent angular colitis, they may have certain underlying nutritional deficiencies as well, which again, um, make up part of your investigations. Um, median rhomboiglossitis, which is almost like a red patch in the center of the tongue. And probably the most common um, presentation with denture wearers is the denture associated um, candidosis. So you may get a patient who off, you know, who happened to have noticed these red spots um, on the roof of their mouth. And um, you know, if you are not aware that there is such a presentation associated with candida, which unfortunately just Actually, on Tuesday, um, I had this exact same case where the patient, unfortunately, was very, very anxious on presentation as um, her um, her treating doctor was worried about its um, the, the sinister pathology behind these red spots. Where in fact, it's in fact it's associated with um, a fungal infection with her denture. Um, very. Rarely are you ever going to come across um, linear gingival erythema and chronic mucocutaneous candidosis, but there are other forms of um, candidal infections in the mouth as well. So predisposing factors for patients who have oral candidosis um, can be divided into either local and systemic. And the reason why I actually added this question is because it is important to um, question why is the patient in fact developing thrush? Is it because they've been immunocompromised and they've developed the pseudomembranous candidosis? Is it because they're not rinsing out after their corticosteroid puffer use and then they've developed um, oral thrush subsequently? Or is it because they've got a very, very dry mouth which is allowing the fungal organisms to flourish in that environment? So identifying any predisposing factors is key so that you can um, manage that as well and prevent another recurrence of oral candidosis from happening. Um, so these are definitely certain key features that you should be aware of. Uh, specific to our case, the patient had dry mouth and her recent course of antibiotics, which is, and may have definitely predisposed her to developing um, oral candidosis. What investigations um, are required for our diagnosis? Um, again, get your handy gauze out and wipe those white plaques. Um, specifically with uh, pseudomembranous candidosis, if you were to wipe off the white plaque, you will notice that red background in the mucosa, so the erythematous background. Sometimes you can even see like pinpoint bleeding of the mucosa because it's just really inflamed. Um, so that's a really key feature with um, pseudomembranous candidosis and it sort of further gives you that confidence that yep, you're dealing with um, a candidal infection. Generally speaking, however, it is a clinical diagnosis, but if you did want to confirm um, further, you can consider either cytology smear, culture swabs. Um, there are also certain oral rinses available, which will actually quantify how many, um, you know, how much candidal species are there. And then also suspicion of underlying nutritional deficiencies or immunosuppression, um, certain blood investigations should also be considered, especially in um, an acute scenario where you can't identify a local predisposing factor, other systemic um, factors uh, such as you know iron deficiencies, anemias, and things like that need to be excluded as well.
So the appropriate management for this patient is, again, obviously identifying and managing the predisposing factor and then commencing antifungal um, therapy. So usually for oral candidosis, um, oral antifungal, uh, oh, sorry, topical antifungal treatment is um, adequate um, and it depends on obviously the patient's medical history and the immunological status. So for this particular patient I would actually use um, either amphotericin B lozenges um, or if they cannot um, dissolve the amphotericin B lozenges consider nystatin. Um, out of all the topical therapies for antifungal um, try and use nystatin as your last resort and that is because while it works um, it has a really high sugar intake and so what it actually does is imagine um, putting you know four times a day this sweet oral drop in a dry mouth environment it can actually sort of be detrimental to the patient's dental health as well so we try and only use nystatin if other sort of topical therapies are not available to us um, Obviously, if a patient is um, medically fine to use meconazole, topical meconazole, that's dactarin, and that's available over the counter. Otherwise, um, amphotericin B is a good alternative as well. Um, that sort of brings me to the end of this case, Sol. Is there anything that you wanted to talk specifically about, or we can move on? I have two questions. Uh, one yeah. is about denture care, uh, is there yeah. anything, uh, is, what is the simplest way to keep dentures? Because I, I suppose, correct me if I'm wrong, that the pseudomembranous uh, uh, candidosis comes from uh, poor denture care, am I right? Or Yeah, so quite often, um, so if, if there's a denture in the patient's mouth, the key questions that you should be asking in, in the context of um, candidosis is, do you take your denture out at night? Um, that's one of the biggest things that patients often forget to do. And um, if they are sleeping with their denture in their mouth and when you take the denture out, you will see that red, you know, erythematous creamy white plaques occurring. And then obviously as part of their denture hygiene and to, to address that certain predisposing factor, um, I recommend them obviously taking their denture out at night time and then soaking it in a Milton's, like a diluted Milton solution. So like one part Milton's to 10 part water. Um, so that's a really nice disinfectant for the denture. And they soak it for you know 30 minutes and then they wash it out there. I don't recommend leaving it overnight in that solution because that can actually discolor the denture itself. Um, and they do that sort of for two to three weeks as you are treating their mouth intraorally for the with the antifungal therapy. Um, and then ensuring that they are in fact cleaning their denture with a separate toothbrush that they don't use for the rest of their mouth um, after every meal with um, just normal soapy dishwashing liquid so not toothpaste or anything like that as well so there's three main things ensuring that the patient's removing their denture at night time um, to actually disinfect the denture you can place them on the diluted milton's um, solution which is one part Milton to 10 parts water. If they didn't have access to Milton solution you can also consider them um, getting them to soak their denture in chlorhexidine. Um, so your classic cervical mouth rinse for example they can soak it in that um, also that's equally as effective as the Milton's. Um, and then finally ensuring that they are in fact cleaning their denture after their meals and then popping their denture back in. So I suppose Milton's solution is something that they can buy from the chemist, right? Yeah, or even in the um, like Coles or Woolworths, they often have it in like okay. the baby section. And it's like a like a yeah, at least a solution. Silly question. Yeah. Now yeah. you mentioned taking swab for diagnosis. Uh, as GPs, yeah. what sort of swab do we take? Is it the bacterial swab we take? I suppose not. What sort of um, so if you have the bacteria, yeah, so with the bacterial swab, with the blue cap is adequate enough to, um, for this. So it should just have that, um, the median in it with the same one that you would take for a bacterial one is adequate enough for the candida. Interesting. So you just basically mm -hmm. take it as much as, you know, lesions that you yep. find and then Correct. you put it back into the gel and yep. that'll do. Interesting. Yep. And, Good. um, 
Yeah, and then just say that obviously you've taken it from either the tongue or the hide palate, depending on which site you're taking it from. And if it grows any candida, that is yep. good enough to call it candidiasis of the oral cancer? Yeah, so usually the results will um, give you the degree of growth as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so generally moderate growth to heavy growth is quite indicative of an infection um, because it is also normal to have um, some level of candida in the mouth. The, I guess the difference between a swab and um, the cytology smear is that the cytology smear actually is positive, like it will stain for the hyphae, whereas the swab itself is just going to grow either candida or not. Um, and quite often in at least like half the population, it is normal for them to be carrying candida in the mouth. So whether that's part of their normal oral flora or if it's an actual active infection, um, that sort of distinguishing feature is made on also what you're seeing clinically as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lalima. That was another that's learning great. point for me. Good. Um, all right, well, let's move on to the third case which is our 36-year-old male with an eight-week history of pain from his left posterior lateral tongue. Um, he's complaining that he keeps biting the area um, and he's fit and healthy, non-smoker, no intake of alcohol and clinically you note this you know, nasty looking lesion. So it's ulcerated keratotic mass. The good thing, well, sorry, not the good thing, what you want to do is that you, anytime there is any lesion in general, um, you want to palpate it, you want to feel it. And what you are feeling for is whether it's soft or whether it's firm. Um, whether that be an ulcer or a white, white patch or a white plaque or a blood blister or even suspected candida, have a feel of it, just run your finger um, along the lesion so you can feel the underlying um, firmness of it. So in this scenario here, this particular lesion is definitely going to be feeling firm because there is a large mass sitting um, on the left lateral tongue. So the most likely diagnosis is obviously oral squamous cell carcinoma. Now the reason why um, I put this in, put this particular case in here is not because it's a classic oral carcinoma case, is to actually highlight that even young patients under the age of 40 are getting a higher incidence of um, oral squamous cell carcinomas. Your most classic sort of presentation is your 60-year-old smoker male um, who would develop an oral squamous cell carcinoma and that's because he's been a lifetime, lifelong smoker um, and has that environmental exposure. But now we're sort of also seeing this new population occurring of younger patients who are actually fit and healthy and who don't have those traditional risk factors still developing um, this condition. So that is just something to keep in the back of your mind as well and to not dismiss as a possible malignancy just because they don't fit the traditional um, factor of that 60 year old male who is a smoker um, in, in this clinical setting. So currently um, SCC is your 16th most common malignancy and at the moment, even now, um, majority of these oral cancers are detected at the advanced stage. And so you alluded to this earlier about pain and that's because majority, majority of the times patients will only present if they have pain. So, and that's one of the biggest sort of delaying factors in picking up these malignancies is a lot of the times if there is an underlying leukoplakia that has transformed, um, patients are not aware that they have it there and they'll only come because they think that they're biting on their tongue or something like that. Um, so unfortunately because of that, the survival rate is still really poor at 50% um, and we're seeing more and more patients under the age of 40 getting diagnosed with, this, um, with SCCs. I have, however, put a list of sort of clinical signs and symptoms to consider with um, with patients presenting with some of these some of these signs and symptoms. And the reason why I've put these here is because a lot of times early malignancies can present with these particular symptoms, and it's important to not dismiss your patient because they're complaining of this. So specifically, these are red flags um, that should be going off 
if you've got a patient with hoarseness um, persisting for more than six weeks, an ulcer in the oral cavity persisting for more than three weeks, any oral swellings persisting for more than three weeks, all sort of red, like your fiery red or your mixed red and white patches of the oral mucosa, dysphagia for more than three weeks, any history of nasal obstruction, unexplained tooth mobility, um, unresolving neck masses for more than three weeks. So never um, sort of dismiss an, uh, a neck mass, especially if you haven't figured out whether it's a reactive lymph node or not. Um, that's always something to ensure you've uh, follow that up properly, cranial neuropathies and orbital masses as well. So these are definitely key things to consider for patients presenting as possible early signs of, of a malignancy developing. Um, so obviously in this case, it's an urgent referral to either oral medicine specialist or maxillofacial surgeon or ENT for an incisional biopsy, which will be sent for histopathological assessment. Um, I've just added in here a little, just a bit more for, I guess, general awareness. Um, there's lots of different tools coming out as well to sort of further improve early detection. Um, so you may come across this at some point of different sort of visualization tools that can be used to help us identify um, early malignancies. Um, and similarly, there's lots of role coming up about artificial intelligence and things like that in the role of oral cancer specifically. Now, with regards to appropriate management for this patient, so, um, you know, urgent referral, I guess it depends um, state by state what pathway is suitable. So here in WA, you've got um, either the private sector where you will be referring to a specific surgeon that you would work with, so either oral maxillofacial surgeon, head and neck surgeon, ENT, who will then decide which um, supporting team they will use, and that's usually through the um, private hospitals, or they would go um, through the public sector, um, and again, depending on you know, the team that's taking charge. So it's usually, there'll be a head and neck cancer clinic in public sectors, which would be a mix of your head and neck surgeons, oral medicine specialists, uh, radiation oncologists, um, your medical oncologists, etc. And they would be the ones taking the care for the patient. And uh, however, in the meantime, what you could consider for your patient while they're waiting for that appointment um, is a organizing either a CT head, neck and chest if in fact the biopsy has confirmed an SCC. Um, it's almost like you're providing a next step for the patient instead of just leaving them in limbo for their consultation appointment to happen. Um, and then once they have gone to the MDT clinic, they'll obviously have a PET CT for staging and then usually treatment is either primarily surgical um, plus or minus radiation or chemotherapy depending on this, um, the, uh, I guess, the stage of the cancer. So that actually brings us to the end of our cases. Um, Sol, did you have any other questions? No, no, fantastic. That was great. Yep. So. Uh, uh, am I right that you're going to give us a very, you know, uh, practical uh, recipe on how to deal with patients complaining of burning tongue, particularly sometimes burning mouth? We, we do yes. come across that a lot in general practice. We have a look. Yeah. We don't see anything abnormal. What can we offer as the primary care physician in terms of, you know, uh, blood tests, checking for nutritional deficiencies? What mm -hmm. do we need to check for? What can yep. we offer? Do we need to refer them straight away? I, 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 you know, or do we, or are there things that we can do before yep. we refer them on to people like yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I did add a little, um, few little slides for that. Um, so yeah, burning mouth syndrome. Um, it actually that was that used to be like the original name for this condition and sort of evolved over a period of time. So you may come across other terms like oral dysesthesia or complex oral sensitivity disorder. And the reason for that is because pay, not all the time patients will actually complain of burning. Um, but that doesn't mean that they are not 
um, suffering with this condition. So generally speaking, it is an intraoral burning that the patient will complain of, or they might complain of what's called a dysesthetic sensation, so an abnormal, unpleasant sensation in the mouth. Um, and the reason behind this change is, compared to just purely burning mouth syndrome, is because it's such a subjective symptom. So some patients will say, oh no, it's not burning, whereas other people will say it's like an itchy feeling or it's a prickly feeling or it's a burnt feeling. So it's really hard to um, sort of dismiss the other group if they are not having an intraoral burning. But one of the key things with this particular condition is the fact that it occurs every single day. So it's a continual chronic thing um, and it's happening for at least over three months. So if you've got those key factors um, being ticked off in your patient history, this particular um, diagnosis or provisional diagnosis should definitely be um, coming up. Um, and again, one of the key things for this particular condition is that the oral mucosa is of normal appearance and the clinical examination, including the sensory testing, is also normal. So you want to have those three main things um, ticked off, or at least when you're assessing a patient for oral burning and you don't see anything in your mouth, this particular diagnosis should um, be coming up. Most of the time you will see it in females and it will be around perimenopausal stage. And I guess once you are sort of heading down this direction, that's when a lot of questions from the patients can start to come up like, why am I feeling this and things like that. And um, the, the simple answer is that we don't know. It is considered a multifactorial sort of condition and it's a mix of sort of um, small fiber neuropathies, hormonal imbalances, immune system imbalances, and definitely psychosocial factors. And the reason why I've put this particular point here is that psychosocial um, history is really important for patients where you're dealing with a possible burning mouth syndrome or oral dysesthesia, um, because a lot of the times they will be dealing with a underlying um, either depression or anxiety. So over 50% of the time there is some sort of background psychosocial stress that is present and driving their um, symptom. Um, so quite um, classically, this, uh, these symptoms will be either gradual or the patient will say, oh, it's happened suddenly. Um, and it will be very varied in terms of symptomology as well. So you will definitely, they can have most commonly the burning pain. Um, otherwise, some patients may say, oh, there's also a metallic taste that I'm noticing. Or other patients may just say that something feels quite foreign in their mouth. Um, quite often it will be pre present on the anterior two-thirds of the tongue or lateral borders of the tongue, but it can also be present on the hard palate, inside of the lips, um, and also um, you know, multiple areas at the same time as well. Uh, and generally speaking, these patients will have these symptoms for you know, over three months before they actually present as well. And severity of the symptoms are usually mild to moderate, and the general um, reporting of these symptoms is that they wake up with the pain or the discomfort presents as the day goes on. And these are actually certain questions you can ask in your history taking in a patient who you're suspecting possible burning mouth syndrome or oral dysesthesia, is that do you, when you wake up, are you aware of the discomfort in your mouth? Does it change as the day progresses or is it the same intensity? Do you have any changes when you're eating and drinking? Does you know eating food and drinking water help your symptoms? A lot of the times they will actually report that their oral symptom improves when they're eating and or drinking water. And similarly, they might experience additional symptoms like um, a dry mouth or a heightened sensation of sweet and sour taste as well. So again, it's a um, diagnosis that's made on exclusion. So you need to exclude all other possibilities of um, etiology behind their either oral burning or this aesthetic sensation. Um, and that basically is determined by a patient history. So um, your classic patient history of waking up in the morning with the constant discomfort. Um, you want to assess their medical history as well because certain medications like such as, um, you know, 
uh, hypertensive medications or antihypertensive medications can cause oral burning as well. So ensure that they haven't commenced any new medications in the sort of onset of their oral burning. And then obviously taking a really thorough psychosocial history as well to identify any factors such as anxiety, depression, OCD that may be also driving their um, oral symptoms. And then with examination, so checking thoroughly the extra oral exam. So we generally recommend a TMJ exam, palpation of the head and neck muscles, checking for any lymph node swellings and also cranial nerve examination. And then an intraoral exam. So you're assessing their hard tissues and soft tissues and most importantly, ruling out any mucosal lesions or presence of dry mouth. Because both of these, um, you know, there's definitely certain lesions that can cause oral burning and having a dry mouth can also cause oral burning as well. Um, let's say that all your examination findings are normal. Um, the patient's medical history is also fine. There's no particular medications that they have commenced recently. And, um, you know, you're sort of at that point where, okay, what else do I need to do? Um, investigations that you'd want to consider are obviously checking their immune status. Um, you're there if, if they have an elevated glucose level, are they anemic, thyroid function, um, and their nutritional status. Um, sometimes oral burning can be due to certain allergies. So if, that, if you're sort of considering that, you may want to consider a patch testing. Um, and similarly as well, if we're worried about any um, cranial nerve dysfunction, then an MRI or CT can be considered as well. So usually the management for these patients are quite challenging and I would suggest that a once you're at the point where you've done your investigations and you're suspecting this oral dysesthesia to consider referral for management um, because management is usually quite multidisciplinary which would involve um, your oral medicine specialist or oral facial pain specialist, um, a pain psychologist, a, a psychiatrist as well if required. Um, and it's really interesting because a lot of the times patients will go through antifungal therapy, you know, using uh, Canalog ointments and things like that in the mouth, even though there isn't actually not, you know, those particular conditions affecting their mouth. So definitely, if you are aware that this condition exists, you will be able to keep that as part of your diagnostic sieve and be able to um, allow a faster referral for the patient, so that they're not waiting for a really long time for um, management to occur. So usually. Um, you know, management is after you've also addressed any sort of underlying features. So if there are, in fact, iron deficient, that all has to be, in, you know, treated before you can, con again, consider going down the pathway of managing it as an oral dysesthesia or burning mouth. Um, but usually what uh, we tend to recommend is trialing um, topical uh, medications and the first line protocol is uh, topical clonazepam. And that is something that you can definitely consider uh, starting the patient on as well, especially if you are certain that that is in fact the condition that you're dealing with. Um, it is important though, if you're ever commencing a patient on topical clonazepam is that they're managed, uh, they're followed up appropriately. And the way that we recommend using this is so sort of they dissolve the tablet in their mouth, they swish it around and then they spit it out and they're not in fact swallowing, them, um, swallowing any of the remnants in their mouth. Um, if you're sort of at this point and you're still quite stuck, that's again definitely a key time to refer um, as patients will likely undergo other systemic medications to try and help alleviate their oral symptoms um, and then also considering additional psychological support as well if there is a significant psychosocial aspect to their oral condition. Um, but most importantly, it is sort of reassuring the patient that I guess it's not a harmful condition in the sense that it's not associated with any malignancies and things like that and setting their patient expectation as well because it is quite a difficult condition to manage. Um, it doesn't respond to medications all the time and so it, the patient really needs to understand I guess the nature of their condition and, and the fact that it is going to be something that they might possibly be living on, uh, living with in the long term. 
Um, so yeah, that's basically the um, end of that presentation. Fantastic. Thank you so much again, Lalima. Look, uh, I, uh, I was looking for duloxetine in the list of your medications and I was because in, nowadays in many psychosocially related or somatic uh, sort of symptoms uh, yeah. with other like restless leg syndrome, not, 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 probably I just need to take that back, many chronic pain conditions uh, yeah. which we don't have any specific answer for and we think it might be psychosomatic. Uh, yeah. Simbolta or duloxetine has, you know, a big role in fibromyalgia and many similar mm -hmm. conditions. I was looking for it in the burning mouth, uh, I should say, you know, what is it, the, this, the aesthetic um, yeah. mouth Oral syndrome? Oral dysthesia, yeah. Oral yeah. dysthesia, this, this, this yeah. um, but it wasn't there. So if there is an element of depression at the same time, then yes. uh, do you have any top choice that you recommend or would you prefer us yeah, to make so, a decision based on clinical grounds. Yeah, look, so duloxetine is usually not um, in the top three list. So what I mm. tend, what is, um, I mean, it's definitely there as part of um, your multiple choices of treatment options um, because the nature of this condition is that it's almost you have to go through so many different ones to help keep helping the patient, especially if it's coming to that stage. Um, so if there is a significant psychosocial component, um, I, I guess, if you are confident enough to prescribe duloxetine, you can to address the psychosocial aspect of it. I would actually, um, we actually involve pain psychologists and things like that who have training in it to, to help more from the psychological perspective as well. But pharmacologically, you can consider duloxetine. Um, other ones you can consider are obviously your amitriptylines and nortriptyline. Um, and then what I find is actually what has shown actually evidence-based is a mix of both topical clonazepam and alpha lipoic acid is quite a um, has has shown to be quite helpful in reducing the burning symptoms um, specifically. Yeah, so that could be something that you could consider as well. But once it starts getting a lot more psychosocially driven, um, you know, pharmacological therapy. Uh, you know, all sorts of variety of pharmacological measures are available, but definitely involving pain psychologists and psychiatrists with sort of background in chronic pain is definitely very useful as well. Mm. Fantastic. Wonderful session, Lalima. I really personally learned a lot and I'm sure our audience oh, have learned a lot as well. That's and good. I'm excited that we are going to have you for another session and another, maybe more sessions be presenting more oral lesions because we want to get uh, and we want to learn as much as possible from you so thanks again and uh, we'll catch up hopefully soon awesome no it's been a pleasure so thank you so much Sol. thank you bye for now